ready. Right, we're ready, everyone? Okay, right, yes, please. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Interests of members of the Scottish Parliament Amendment Bill Committee. This is our second meeting, and uh, just welcome everyone. Um, obviously, remind everyone, as I have done, just to turn off your mobile phone as it can interfere with the sound system. Uh, we haven't received any apologies, although I know that two of our members are due here um, at any moment, and um, I'll have a word with them afterwards. Um, <laughs> there's only one item on today's agenda, and it's stage two of the interests of members of the Scottish Parliament Amendment Bill, and I'd like to welcome to the meeting uh, Stuart Stevenson, uh, Convener of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee, and the member in charge of the bill. Um, okay. Basically, um, everyone should have the bill and marshalled list of amendments with you. There's also a groupings list. Uh, it's quite straightforward. Two amendments to be disposed of today, and they have been grouped together, as you will know. Okay. Um, so, firstly, uh, questions. Uh, the question basically is uh, sections 1 to 8 um, of the bill. Uh, are we all agreed that these can be agreed? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, so section 9 of the bill, which is prohibition of paid advocacy. Um, I'd like to call Amendment 1 in the name of Stuart Stevenson, grouped with Amendment 2. Uh, Mr Stevenson. Uh, thank you very much uh, indeed, Convener. Um, I'll start by outlining the context for uh, these provisions. The present position is that paid advocacy is where an individual uses their position as an MSP to advocate a particular matter in return for a payment, including a benefit in kind, or to urge any other MSP to do so. It is a criminal offence and a breach of the Interests Act for an MSP to undertake paid advocacy. It's worth noting that no MSP has ever been found to have breached these rules. The Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee is very clear, given the gravity with which paid advocacy should be treated, that the criminal offence remains appropriate. The committee's consultation paper proposed that the definition of paid advocacy should be amended for greater consistency with the Bribery Act 2010. In particular, we noted that the Bribery Act incorporated the act of agreeing to receive inducements within the offence of being bribed. The paid advocacy offence currently requires actual receipt of an inducement by an MSP or by an MSP's partner, where this is in connection with the member's parliamentary role and results in some benefit to the MSP. It does not currently incorporate payments or benefits in kind that a member agrees to receive. The bill amends the definition of paid advocacy so that agreeing to receive inducements as well as actually receiving them would be an offence and thus a breach of the Interest Act. During stage one of the debate, Tavish Scott asked whether the offence of paid advocacy as expanded by the provisions in the bill would cover a scenario where a member requests a payment to undertake paid advocacy. There is no doubt that receiving, agreeing to receive and requesting an inducement in exchange for carrying out paid advocacy actually or after the, before or after the event is an offence under Section 2 of the Bribery Act 2010. Now this is a complex but comprehensive provision covering corruption in a wide range of public and private sector settings. The paid advocacy offence in this bill is a much simpler provision which is more specifically geared towards abuses of the procedures of this Parliament. Requesting an inducement is also covered by the paid advocacy offence as amended by section 9 of this bill, but only where some form of agreement flows from it and action is taken by the member on the basis of that. In other words, it does not matter who made the initial approach in this context. A purely unilateral request for an inducement would not be covered, however. This is partly because of the absence of any specific reference to requesting as opposed to receiving or agreeing to receive. It is also because undertaking the advocacy part of the paid advocacy is an essential part of the element. It is not currently an offence to receive an inducement so long as the member does not in fact do anything in response to the receipt of the inducement or urge another member to do something. 
Similarly, even if the bill is enacted, it will still not be an offence to agree to receive an inducement so long as nothing is thereafter actually done on the basis of that. Where a unilateral request for inducement is concerned, it is unlikely that the requirements of this section will be satisfied because if the member is rebuffed or simply ignored, he or she is not likely to proceed to do anything on the basis of an inducement he or she could have no expectation of actually receiving. There are possible alternatives uh, to this. One is to do nothing on the basis that all of this is criminal under the Bribery Act and the pay advocacy offence is specifically about abuse of Holyrood procedures and facilities. However, I have decided to propose amendments to ensure that the offence covers a member requesting an inducement to carry out advocacy, but only where the advocacy actually takes place. And I believe these amendments uh, put these matters beyond doubt. Specifically, the First Amendment amends Section 9 of the Bill, which in turn amends Section 14 of the 2000 Act. This amendment restructures subsection 2B of section 14 and essentially does two things. Firstly, it adds the reference to requesting a payment or benefit in kind for carrying out paid advocacy. Secondly, it introduces a conditional element to the provision, namely that the payment or benefit in kind results or if when made or given would result in some benefit to the member. This puts beyond doubt that the payment or benefit does not actually have to have been received for the offence to be committed. This is ensures that where a member agrees to receive or requests a payment or benefit, the offence is committed even when the inducement has not been received. This tidies up the provision in the bill so that it sits better with the addition of agrees to receive and requests. The Second Amendment simply adds a reference to requesting to subsection 3 of section 14 of the 2006 Act, which sets out the exceptions to these provisions. Assistance in the preparation of members' bill or assistance with amendments to any bill or a debate on subordinate legislation or a legislative consent motion will not be considered as paid advocacy. Uh, convener, I pleasure in moving Amendment 1. I thank you very much, uh, Mr Stevenson. And uh, I'm now going to allow other members um, to make uh, comment. And Mary Scanlon. Thank you, Convener. I appreciate that. Um, I'd like to thank Mr Stevenson for a very comprehensive uh, explanation of his uh, amendments, as I, I would expect nothing less. Um, can I just ask, Convener, that I, I think we're all certainly I'm very absolutely clear about um, uh, advocacy in return for payment. I think that's absolutely crystal clear. I think what I would like a bit more information on, I think it's perhaps a more grey area, is including a benefit in kind. Uh, if I can just give you an example, uh, somewhere in my diary we've got a dinner with the BMA and they're likely to be asking or suggesting things for the NHS. Um, if I accept a dinner from the BME and next week I mention something in Parliament that resulted from that conversation, then I have had a benefit in kind uh, and I would be asking a question on the basis of that. So I, th I think just to be helpful to, to all MSPs, can you tell us exactly can you perhaps uh, be helpful, convener, if the member could give us some examples of benefits in kind? What is a communication flow? What is a briefing? Uh, you know, and if you sit down and have a coffee or a dinner over that briefing, you've received a benefit in kind, and you may go forward and ask something, advocate on that organisation's behalf. I just wonder, convener, if I could seek some clarity around the issue of benefit in kind. Uh, hold on a second, please, Mr. Stevenson. Um, can I just ask, thanks very much, Mary. Can I just ask if there's anyone else has any questions for Mr. Stevenson? Um, okay. Well, that seems to be the only question. Uh, Mr. Stevenson, could you enlighten us, please? Uh, thank you, and, and that's a, a good question to ask. And I'll, I'll just make the very general point that uh, uh, members should always, should they have any doubt about whether provisions of the Members' Interest Act or the standards generally that apply to members, should always 
seek the advice of the clerks who will, will be very happy to uh, advise in advance. But turning to the very specific circumstances that Mrs. Scanlon uh, has, has described, I think the important point to bear in mind is that the benefit is conditional upon an act. There has to be an offer or a solicitation of a benefit is the first test that has to be applied before the paid advocacy rules kick in. Secondly, the paid advocacy needs to be consequential upon that agreement and, uh, and it, it needs to be undertaken. However, the benefit does not need to be delivered. Now, the benefit in the case that's given, being at a dinner, is incidental to the action that was taken. That benefit, that dinner, was, was taking place in any event. And what happened at that dinner as a result of a conversation, was not linking the provision of the dinner to that benefit that the member received. And I think that's the test. But at the end of the day, I do come back to that it's always a good idea for members to drop by room TG1 where the clerks are, are happy to answer questions. So I, I, th I think that uh, answers the question, I'm, and I'm getting nodding heads on both sides of me, so I have captured the essence of it. It's that link, that conditionality between the benefit that's delivered and the action that the member has taken, which I think in the circumstances which the member describes, probably quite common circumstances, um, that link is absent, and therefore it would not be caught by the provisions we're seeking to introduce here. Okay. That's very you. helpful, that convener. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks uh, to Mary Scanlon. Thank you to Stuart Stevenson. Uh, there being no other members uh, wishing to ask a question uh, of Mr. Stevenson, um, Stuart Stevenson, uh, would you like to press or withdraw Amendment 1? I'd like to press Amendment 1. Convener. Amendment 1. Thank you very much. And therefore, the question is that Amendment 1 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes, we are. Thank you very much. I uh, call Amendment 2 in the name of Stuart Stevenson. Already debated with Amendment 1, uh, Stuart Stevenson to move? Move. Formally. Thank you very much. Okay. That is Section 9. Oops, big pun. In Section 9. Oh, right. The question is that Amendment 2 be agreed to, big pun. Uh, are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, right. The question is that Section 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Okay, section 10 to 19, the question is, sections 10 to 19 be agreed to? Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. And finally, I believe the question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Thank you. And that ends stage two consideration of the bill. And thank you to everyone who's put in the onerous task of being here today. Thank you very much. Okay.